Hello. This is the second part of the 13th lesson in heat transfer. In the 13th lesson, we have been continuing our discussion of steady state multidimensional conduction heat transfer. In this part of the lesson, we will be talking about how to validate the result of a finite volume method analysis. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to check whether the solution obtained from a finite volume method analysis is internally consistent and thus valid. On with the lesson. When conducting a finite volume method analysis, it is important to check whether the solution is valid. Validating the result ensures that there were no mistakes made in the development and solution of the governing finite volume method equations. When presenting the analysis to your boss, funding agent, or fellow engineers, you should show them that you validated the result. Doing so lends to your credibility as an engineer. It makes your fellow engineers and managers more willing to trust what you say. This is important for influencing the outcomes of decision making. Finally, a finite volume method result that has not been validated is not a complete result. Always validate the answer. When conducting a finite volume method analysis, use an energy balance over the entire numerical domain to validate the result. If you recall from a previous lesson, one of the characteristics that defines the finite volume method and makes it different from alternative approaches such as finite element is that the finite volume method analysis guarantees conservation of energy is exactly satisfied over the entire calculation domain. We can thus use this characteristic as our tool for validating the result. Let's consider an example. I will read the problem statement so you can become familiar with the geometry and the situation. A finite volume analysis of the heat transfer in an air-cooled gas turbine blade was conducted. The geometry of the blade is shown in the figure. The outside surface of the turbine blade is exposed to hot combustion gases at 1700 Kelvin, and the convection at the surface is characterized by a coefficient of 1000 watt per square meter Kelvin. Air at 400 Kelvin is passed through the blades to cool them in these air channels. The heat transfer at the surface of the cooling channel is characterized by a convection coefficient of 200 watt per meter squared Kelvin. The numerical mesh used in the analysis used a grid spade, grid space of one millimeter on a side. Here, the numerical mesh used to analyze the turbine blade is depicted. The mesh takes advantage of three lines of symmetry. The problem is symmetric along the center line of the blade. This forms the lower surface of the numerical mesh. The problem is also symmetric in the midplane between the channels and the midplane within a channel. These two surfaces also form the left and right edges of the numerical domain. Remember that lines of symmetry are adiabatic surfaces. There is no net heat transfer across the line of symmetry because the temperature gradient must be zero there. Consequently, there is a adiabatic surface on the planes that coincide with the lines of symmetry. There is a zero flux condition here. The nodal temperatures calculated using the finite volume method are shown below. And the question is, is this result valid? First, let's calculate the heat transfer into the turbine blade. Now because of the lines of symmetry, there is no heat transfer across these surfaces. So we know that they don't enter into the calculation. So the question is, where does the heat transfer in? If we look at the temperatures sol sol solved from the finite volume method, we can see that the temperatures along the blade surface in contact with the hot combustion gases are lower than the temperature of the gases, as one would expect. So energy will transfer from the hot gas into the blade along the top surface. In the cooling channel, the air at 400 Kelvin is cooler 
than the temperatures of nodes 15, 16, 17, 18, and 21. Heat transfer is thus coming out at this surface. So when we're looking at the heat transfer into the blade, we need only analyze the top surface. Here we have heat transfer into the six volumes represented by the six nodes. Heat transfer is by convection. We thus apply Newton's law of cooling. The following condition applies to each node. The convection heat transfer coefficient associated with the combustion gases times the area over which there is heat transfer into that volume times the appropriate temperature difference. If we want to get the total amount of energy transferred in, we add up the heat transfer across all six volumes. Here I have applied Newton's law of cooling to the first and second volumes. Similar equations apply for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth volumes. In the first volume, we have the heat transfer coefficient times the area of the face over which there is heat transfer times the temperature difference, the difference in temperature between the fluid temperature and the nodal temperature 1, where we have assumed that the temp T1 exists across the entire plane, the entire top surface is isothermal at the node temperature T1. Similar equation applies to volume 2. Here we assume that the nodal temperature T2 exists across the entire top surface, and so forth and so on for the remaining four volumes. Now note that the volumes all have similar areas. Volumes 2, 3, 4, and 5 have the same area for heat transfer, whereas volumes 1 and 6 have half of that area, since these volumes are half of the size of the volumes 2, 3, 4, and 5. We can take advantage of that in our equation and substitute the common area for 2, 3, 4, and 5 and half of that area for 1 and 6. The area for heat transfer is this node spacing delta x times a unit depth into and out of the page. This means that our calculation will be done on a per unit length basis. We will be calculating a watt per unit meter because we're doing analysis for one meter of turbine blade length. Note I've applied the one half to the first and sixth volumes to account for half of the heat transfer area given by delta x times one. We can now substitute values for the temperatures into our equation for the total heat transfer. T1 takes on the value of 1526, T2 takes on the value of 1525.3, and so forth and so on. Now we can begin to crunch the numbers to apply the, the, the arithmetic. Doing so provides the following values. Note that the units are 1000 watt per meter squared Kelvin times 0.001 meter times 1 meter. So we'll have a watt per Kelvin and we're multiplying by temperature differences also in the units of a temperature difference. Our result is that the heat transfer in is 885.15 watts. Now we can calculate the heat transfer out of the turbine blade. Recall that the heat transfer out is across the surfaces coincident with the cooling channel. Here are the heat transfers. We have heat transfer across um, the volume associated with node 21, heat transfer across the two faces associated in the volume with T15, 16, 17, and 18. Heat transfer again is by convection, so we apply Newton's law of cooling. Here, because we want to have positive values for heat transfer out, and we know that the nodal temperatures are higher than the temperature of the fluid, the temperature difference has the high temperature first, which is the source temperature, and the low temperature second, which is the fluid temperature, since energy is transferring from the high temperature to the low temperature. This will result in a positive value for the rate of heat transfer, even though it is an out, because we have drawn the arrows as a heat transfer out. Just like when we are getting the heat transfer in, we simply add up all of the heat transfer across the faces. Again, many of these heat transfers have common heat transfer areas. 16 and 17 both have a heat transfer area of delta x times 1. Volumes 18 and 21 have half of that area since the volumes are half the size. Volume 15 is interesting because heat transfer occurs in two directions out of this volume across the south boundary of the corner and across the east boundary. 
We assume, however, that the nodal temperature T15 exists across both faces. It is the same temperature difference associated with the convection heat transfer. Thus, this really simply is also a total area of delta x, the nodal spacing. So A15 is the same as A16 and 17. I've denoted that here in our equation, and now we simply add all these up, and we can take advantage of the common area of the faces. Nodal spacing times 1 meter. We have half of the area on the volume 18 and on volume 21. We are now in a position to substitute in values for the temperatures. T15, T16, T17, T18, and T21. Now we apply the arithmetic. and we calculate that the rate of heat transfer out is 885.17 watts. This is the heat transfer rate out of the quarter section of the turbine blade. At steady state, the rate of heat transfer into the turbine blade should equal the rate of heat transfer out of the turbine blade. If we look at the energy balance applied to the entire control volume, the entire numerical domain, because the blade is at steady state and there is no thermal energy generation, Right? The difference between the energy flowing in and out must add to zero. In other words, what flows in must equal what flows out. This condition can be the check on the numerical result. When we calculate the difference between the energy flowing in and out, this value for check should be zero if the solution is valid. We calculated 885.15 watts flowing into the blade and 885.17 watts flowing out of the blade. The check is the difference between these two values. It has a value of negative 0.02 watts. This is a very small number compared to the rate of heat transfer in. If you take 0.02 watts and divide by 885.15 watts, the percentage difference is less than 0.003%. The small imbalance can be attributed to rounding errors in the reporting of the temperatures of the nodal temperatures. The result is thus valid. And that is an example of how to validate a finite volume method result. A similar approach can be applied to any problem. If the method is valid, then the energy balance should always come out to be zero within a very small percentage such as this. This is the end of the lesson.